Okay, this is chapter 16, Singing in the Clouds. Louis sat awake, looking into the sea. Phil was asleep. Mac was virtually catatonic. Two sharks about eight feet long were placidly circling the raft. Each time one slid past, Louis studied its skin. He had banged sharks in the nose many times, but had never really felt the hide, which was said to feel like sandpaper. Curious, he dropped a hand into the water and laid it lightly on a passing shark. Feeling its back and dorsal fin as it slid beneath him, it felt rough, just as everyone said. The shark swished on. The second shark passed, and Louis again let his hand follow his body. Beautiful, he thought. Soon after, Louis noticed something odd. Both sharks were gone. Never in four weeks had the sharks left. Louis got up on his knees and leaned out over the water, looking as far as he could, puzzled. No sharks. He was kneeling there, perched over the edge of the raft, when one of the sharks that he had touched leapt from the water at a terrific speed, mouth wide open, lunging straight at his head. Louis threw both hands in front of his face. The shark collided with him, heads on, trying to get his mouth on around his upper body. Louis, his hands on the animal's snout, shoved as hard as he could, and the shark splashed back into the water. A moment later, the second shark jumped in. Louis grabbed an oar and struck the shark in the nose, and it jerked back and slid away. Then the first shark lunged for him again. Louis was recoiling when he saw an oar swing past, sending the animal backwards into the ocean. To Louis's surprise, it wasn't Phil who had saved him. It was Mac. Louis had no time to thank him. One of the sharks jumped up again, followed by the other. Louis and Mac sat side by side, clubbing each shark as it lunged at them. Mac was a new man. A moment before, he had seemed almost comatose. Now he was infused with frantic energy. For several minutes, the sharks took turns bellying onto the raft with gaping mouths, always launching themselves from the same spot. Finally, they gave up. Louis and Mac collapsed. Phil, who had been startled awake but had been un unable to help because there were only two oars, stared at them in groggy confusion. What happened, he said. Louis looked at Mac, Mac with happy amazement and told him how grateful and proud of him he was. Mac crumpled on the bottom of the raft, smiled back. He had pushed himself beyond his body's capacities, but the frightened, childlike expression had left his face. Mac had reclaimed himself. That's good. I'm only about to sneeze. Louis was furious at the sharks. He had thought that they had an understanding. The men would stay out of the sharks' turf, the water, and the sharks would stay off theirs, the raft. That the sharks had taken shots at him when he had gone overboard, and when the raft had been mostly submerged after the strapping, that was fair enough. But their attempt to poach men from the reinflated raft struck Louis as dirty cruel. He stewed all night, scowled hatefully at the sharks all day, and eventually made a decision. If the sharks were going to try to eat him, he was going to try to eat them. He knelt by the raft wall and watched the sharks, searching for a beatable opponent. One that looked about five feet long past. Louis thought he could take it. Louis and Phil made a plan. They had a little bait on the raft, probably the remains of their last bird. Phil hung it on a fish hook and strung it into the water at the one end of the raft. At the other end, Louis knelt, facing the water. Smelling the bait, the shark swam towards Phil, orienting himself so that his tail was under Louis. Louis leaned as far overboard as he could without losing his balance, plunged both hands into the water, and grabbed the tail. The shark took off. Louis, gripping the tail, flew out of the raft and crashed into the water, sending a large serving of the Pacific up his nose. The shark whips its tail and flung Louis off. Louis bolted back on the raft so quickly that he later had no memory of how he had done it. Soaking and embarrassed, Louis rethought his plan. His first error had been one of appraisal. Sharks were stronger than they looked. His second had been to fail to brace himself properly. His third had been to allow the shark's tail to stay in the water, giving the animal something to push against. He settled in to wait for a smaller shark. In time, a smaller one, perhaps four feet long, arrived. Louis knelt at the raft's side, tipping his weight backward and keeping his knees far apart to brace himself. Phil dangled a baited hook in the water. The shark swam for the bait. Louis clapped his hands around the tail and heaved it out of the water. The shark thrashed, but could neither get free nor pull Louis into the water. Louis dragged the animal onto the raft. The shark twisted and snapped, and Phil grabbed a flare cartridge and jammed it into the shark's mouth, pinning the shark down. Louis took the pliers and stabbed the screwdriver into the, animal, into the animal's eyes. The shark died instantly. Today's Memorial Day, and so there's lots of jets flying in Hawaii. What you just heard was a sonic boom. In his Honolulu survival course, 
Louis had been told that the liver was the only part of a shark that was edible. Getting at it was no mean feat. Even with a knife, shark skin is about as easy to cut as a coat of mail. With only the edge of mirror to cut with, the labor was draining. After much sawing, Louis managed to break the skin. The flesh underneath stank of ammonia. Louis cut the liver out and it was sizable. They ate it eagerly, giving Mac a larger portion. And the first time since breakfast on May 26th, they were all full. The rest of the shark reeked, so they threw it overboard. Later, using the same technique, they caught a second shark and again ate the liver. This is this has happened uh, around the same time of year that's right now. So this was in like 1942. Uh, this is like exactly 76 years ago. Just right over about 500 miles in the ocean, or a thousand, thousand, couple thousand miles over in the ocean that way. Among the sharks, uh, among the sharks, words seemed to get around. No more small sharks came near. Large sharks, some sit long, 12 feet long, lumbered alongside the raft, but Louis thought better of taking them on. The men's stomachs were soon empty again. Mac was in a sharp downward spiral. He rarely moved. All three men had lost a staggering amount of weight. But Mac had shriveled the most. His eyes, sunken in their sockets, stared out lifelessly. It was nightfall somewhere around the 30th day. The men threw, went through their usual routine, bathing water into the raft and entwining themselves for warmth. The sky was clear and starry, and the moon shone on the water. The men fell asleep. Louis woke to a tremendous crash, stinging pain, and the sensation of weightlessness. His eyes snapped open and he realized that he, Mac, and Phil were airborne. They flopped down together on the raft and twisted about in confusion. Something had struck the bottom of the raft with awesome power. Their garden variety sharks that made up their entourage weren't large enough to hit them with such force and had never behaved in this way. Looking over the side of the raft, they saw it. Swelling up from under the water came a livid limp, a vast white mouth, a broad back parting the surface and a long dorsal fin, ghostly in the moonlight. The animal was some 20 feet long, more than three times the length of the raft. Louis recognized its feature from his survival school training. It was a great white shark. As the castaways watched in terrified silence, the shark swam the length of one side of the raft and bent around to the other, exploring it. Pausing on the surface, it swished its tail and slapped it into the raft, sending the raft skidding sideways and splashing a wave of water into the men. Louis, Mac, and Phil came up on their knees in the center of the raft and clung to one another. The shark began to swim to the other side. Louis whispered, Don't make a noise. Again came the mighty swing, the shower of water, the jolt through the raft and the men. Around and around the shark went, drenching the raft with each pass. It seemed to be playing with the raft. With every pass, the men cringed and waited to be capsized. Finally, the great back slid under the sea and smoothed down behind it. It did not surface again. Louis, Phil, and Mac lay down again. The water around them was now cold and none of them could sleep. The next morning, Mac could no longer sit up. He lay on the floor of the raft, little more than a wrinkled mummy, his gaze fixed far away. One last albatross landed. Louis caught it, wrenched its head off, and handed it to Phil. Phil turned it upside down over Mac and let the blood flow into his mouth. As Louis and Phil ate the meat, dipping it into the ocean to give it flavor, they fed bits to Mac, but it didn't revive him. In subsequent days, Mac became a faint whisper of a man. His water tins ran dry. When Phil opened his tin and took a sip of the little he had left, Mac asked if he could drink from it. For Phil, thirst had been the cruelest trial, and he knew that the water left in his tin, essential to his own survival, couldn't save Mac. He gently told Mac that he didn't have enough left to share. Louis was sympathetic to Phil, but he couldn't bring himself to refuse Mac. He gave him a salt, small sip of his water. Mac is dying. That evening, Phil heard a small voice. It was Mac, asking Louis if he was going to die. Louis looked over at Mac, who was watching him. Louis thought it would be disrespectful to lie to Mac, who might have something that he needed to say or do before life left him. Louis told him that he thought he'd die that night. Mac had no reaction. Phil and Louie lay down, put their arms around Mac, and went to sleep. Wow. Mac asked Louie, he's like, Louie, am I going to die? And what did Louie say? Louie's a straight-up guy. Louie said, I think you're going to die tonight, man. Everybody dies, man. It's something we all have in common. That Everybody's scared to death of it. No pun intended.
I mean, everybody's scared of dying. Yeah, it's something we all have to go through. I'm gonna die, you're gonna die. You're watching this, you're gonna die. Your kids are gonna die, your parents are gonna die. Everybody that you know, that you've ever known, that you will ever know, will die. Wow, man. That evening, Phil heard a small voice. It was Mac asking Louie if he was going to die. Louie looked over at Mac, who was watching him. Louis thought it would be disrespectful to lie to Mac, who might have something that he needed to say or do before life left him. Louis told him that he probably that he thought he'd die that night. Mac had no reaction. Phil and Louis lay down, put their arms around Mac, and went to sleep. Sometime that night, Louis was lifted from sleep by a breathy sound, a breathy sound, a deep outrushing of air, slow and final. He knew what it was. Sergeant Francis McNamara had begun his last journey with a panicked act, consuming the raft's precious food stores, and in doing so, he had placed himself and his raft mates in the deepest jeopardy. But in the last days of his life, in the struggle against the deflating raft and the jumping sharks, he had given all he had left. It wasn't enough to save him, it probably hastened his death, but it may have made the difference between life and death for Phil and Louis. Had Mac not survived the crash, Louis and Phil might, not, might have been dead by that 33rd day. In his dying days, Mac had redeemed himself. Uh, Mac saved Louis's life in this chapter with the oars. The sharks jumped onto the raft, and, were, and, and Louis couldn't take them both. Phil didn't have an oar, and Mac jumped into action and saved Louis's life. With three people, that really helped him out and kept him alive. We're all in it together. We're all brothers and sisters. Nobody is irrelevant. Don't let any a young person call anyone else irrelevant. Nobody is irrelevant. We're all human beings on this planet. Things can be irrelevant, but people, they are not.